Um, I'm really happy to be here today. I thought um, I'd start just by talking a little bit about myself. Um, so my name is Shelly Casey. I'm the head of patient advocacy at Wave Life Sciences. I've been there for about a year and a half, and this is my first in-person HDEO conference. And you know, since joining, I've had the chance to meet Seth and Jenna and several other members of the HD community. Um, but not having a direct connection to HD, I still feel like I'm part of it. So appreciate all of you for, for welcome, welcoming me to uh, part of the HD community. Um, my role at, at WAVE is really in advocacy to be the bridge between all of you and our company. So what my job is, is to help educate my colleagues on what your priorities are and bring your insights and feedback into the work that we're doing to develop medicines. Um, my job also working with all of you is to, to share with you updates um, on the work that we're doing in HD, except for here. So one of my goals today is to try not to talk too much specifically about our program, but really to, to talk about a few other things. So the agenda for my presentation is one, to talk about WAVE and, and share with you a little bit of our history in Huntington's disease. Two, I want to talk to you a little bit about our allele selective approach. And Going last, you know, I know you've heard a lot of um, information today, so it may be a little bit repetitive, but hopefully it helps um, further your understanding of, of what we're doing. And then lastly, wanted to talk a little bit about our approach to clinical trials. Um, so hopefully with that, I'm happy to, to take questions at the end. Uh, so forward-looking statements, uh, this is always part of an industry presentation. And really what it boils down to is that while we're very hopeful about our development programs, um, in drug development there is certainly a lot of risk, and so there is no promises. And so really that's what these forward-looking statements get to. Uh, so starting a little bit about WAVE. Um, you know, we are a genetic medicines company focused on delivering transformational therapies for people with serious diseases, such as Huntington's disease. We also work in a few other therapeutic areas. So we're in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We're also in ALS and frontal temporal dementia. And we have an early stage preclinical program in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Uh, what you can also see on this slide is um, our company, uh, the people at WAVE, are really committed to, to engaging with the patient community. We love bringing in, in speakers, uh, caregivers, and individuals living with Huntington's disease. And then we bike, we walk, we run, we bake. Um, the other day we had a bake sale, and it's amazing when you kind of do a throwback bake sale how much money you can raise for the community. So our bake sale, I think, raised almost $1,000. So again, we try to get creative in terms of the ways that we can support the, the Huntington's community as well as really make our employees all feel like they're connected, even though, you know, me being here today is the one representative. Uh, I also wanted to share just a little bit about uh, WAVE's history in Huntington's disease. So as a company, we've been around for about 10 years. Um, in 2015 was really the, the year that we started doing research in Huntington's disease. Our first generation program received FDA orphan drug designation back in 2016, and we kicked off and started enrolling in that program in 2017. In 2021, that program was, was discontinued, um, but actually pretty quickly that year, within about six months, we were able to kick off and initiate our next generation Huntington's disease clinical program. In the fall of last year, we had positive data um, on the program, and today the study is continuing to, to is still ongoing and continuing to, to recruit patients. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to point out as you look at this timeline. One was, you know, during our first generation program, we were continuing to do research to figure out how do we continue to improve and, and improve the molecules that we have in development. Uh, and so because of that work that we had underway is really what led us to be able to pivot so quickly into our next generation program. Uh, during this our journey, we've also learned quite a few things. One, uh, we've gotten to know all of you and the Huntington's disease community and, and learn from you. We've also had the opportunity to meet with a lot of clinicians around the world, and so really starting to establish those relationships. Um, we've activated sites globally, and so have been able to figure out, you know, how do we learn from that process and, and really improve as we think about 
going back to some of those sites for, for future generation trials or um, as we continue to do our research. Um, we also, you know, in terms of screening to participate in studies, there's a lot that goes into that. And so we've also been able to, to create some efficiencies there. And throughout this process as well, as I mentioned, we were able to improve our chemistry and really change the molecular structure of, a, of our molecules. So that's just a little bit about WAVE. What I'd like to talk to you now is our approach to Huntington's disease and the selective lowering of, of mutant Huntington protein. So as we've heard throughout the day, uh, Huntington's disease is caused by a mutation in the Huntington gene. Uh, so for a healthy individual, you receive two genes, one from each parent. And for a healthy individual, you have two wild type alleles. For an individual living with Huntington's disease, you get a mutant uh, gene from, from one parent and a healthy gene from the other parent, really leading to 50% mutant Huntington in your system and 50% wild type Huntington. So Huntington's disease is really impacted by the accumulation of the toxic mutant Huntington protein and the reduction of wild type Huntington protein. So what we believe is that um, the preservation of wild type Huntington may support the health and function of the brain. So again, in some previous conversations that we've had today, there's been some conversation around really what, what does um, normal Huntington do in the body? And so what wild type Huntington does is it really helps to support healthy brain function. It promotes health, survival, and communication between neurons across important brain functions. It supports CSF circulation to provide neurons with the nutrients that they need. Uh, it allevi alleviates effects of brain stressors, including mutant Huntington. And so we really want to work as best we can to preserve that function. Mutant Huntington, on the other hand, cannot perform all the functions of wild type Huntington and may actually add additional stress. And so what this picture really tries to depict is that there's a, a little bit of a tug of war going on between mutant as well as um, the additional stress and, and wild type Huntington. And so uh, what we believe is really that the preservation of the wild type Huntington will help support overall um, health and function of the brain. Uh, so there are a couple of distinct approaches, you know, as, as Peter and Lauren had just talked about and some of the earlier presentations. So um, most uh, Huntington lowering approaches are non-selective and they lower both mutant Huntington as well as wild type Huntington. Waves approach is allele selective and so we're looking to target the mutant Huntington gene uh, and spare the wild type Huntington gene. And so Lauren talked a little bit about this. I think this was a good question that somebody, hopefully you're still in the audience, asked earlier, is like, well, how do you do that? How do you know that you're targeting just the mutant Huntington gene? And it is, it is because of these SNPs. So there's single nucleotide, nucleotide polymorphisms that exist within um, the DNA on the specific allele. So they're normally occurring variations in the DNA. You can kind of think about it like a pin on a, uh, yeah, a pin on a map where maybe just one letter is actually different. Um, so some SNPs occur more frequently on the mutant Huntington allele than the healthy, uh, healthy allele. And the association between the SNPs and the mutant Huntington is really what makes it possible to be able to selectively target. Um, in an earlier session today, there was a question about whether or not there is anything that's different between different ethnicities and, and whether or not you know, there's a different prevalence. Uh, and what we know right now, based on the literature, uh, as, uh, in terms of the, the percentage or prevalence of these SNPs, is that there's about 40% of people with Huntington's that have um, SNP3, and then there's about 70 to 80%, I think, that have SNP1 and SNP2. Um, so just wanted to, to share a little bit more about that, but we believe that um, these SNPs are really are going to enable us to be able to identify uh, and target the, the right allele and really target the mutant Huntington protein. Um, so this is just, again, to summarize, you have your wild type Huntington RNA that's transcribed into a healthy protein. Uh, you have the mutant Huntington RNA that is identified because of the SNP that exists within it that produces the toxic protein. 
And really what we want to do is interrupt that um, production of toxic protein and target this SNP to, to knock down the mutant Huntington, um, hun Huntington RNA. Okay, so that's a little bit about our, our, um, our approach to, to treating Huntington's and the allele selective approach that we're taking. I wanted to share just a little bit about our approach to clinical development. So first and foremost, we're committed to improving. I think when you are in drug development, you definitely want to take everything that you can and that you've learned from your previous generations and apply them to the next generation work that you're doing. Um, so we have applied historical learnings. I mentioned that we've been able to gain experience in clinical trials um, with the different trial sites and investigators. We've been able to enhance our, our testing and our screening. Uh, once people say, you know, hey, I'm interested, we want to make sure that we're able to efficiently figure out whether or not somebody might be eligible to participate. Um, and then we also improved our, our, our chemistry and the molecular backbone of the molecule. We also have a history at WAVE of, of clinical trial innovation. So in the US, the FDA uses complex innovative design, which is really a mechanism to use historical data and different controls to try to reduce the number of patients that are required to participate in clinical, clinical trials. Um, we've also incorporated an adaptive design in our approach, and my next slide goes into a little bit more detail around the benefits of, of utilizing an adaptive design. But basically, it allows you to collect data and make decisions throughout the, the drug development process. Um, and I think one thing to note that I thought was interesting is, you know, in our first generation program, we didn't use an adaptive design, and it took us about two and a half years before we had a first look at the data to figure out whether or not, you know, what the, whether or not it was working. Um, and so far in our, in our next generation program, we've been able, just a year after initiating the study, to, to look at data and really to inform the next steps of the program. So just uh, in summary, you know, some additional benefits of utilizing an adaptive study design. It enables changes to one or more aspects of the study. So we talked a little bit about dose, dose frequency, um, and really that allows you to um, inform and, and modify the study as it's underway. Um, so it allows you to adjust to information. And this study and most studies are really being monitored by an external uh, data, data safety monitoring board, which is made up of experts in the HD community, experts, key opinion leaders, um, who review the data and make recommendations on next steps. Um, so the intent is to make clinical trials flexible, efficient, fast, while also preserving the integrity of them. It may require fewer participants, and then it also provides the ability to stop a study. Um, and I think this is also really important. So if you find out early that it, it's not working and may not be beneficial to, to uh, the participants, I think it's important to, to stop the study so that they can then pursue other options. And then, you know, as I've mentioned already, it allows us the opportunity to improve future study designs and hopefully be able to accelerate research based on the learnings that we've had. I did just want to note that we are global. Um, so this is just a, a picture of different countries that we're, we're conducting our trials in. For any information, talk to your doctor um, and, and we'll leave it at that. Um, so in summary, uh, you know, I, when I think about drug development, it's definitely a team sport. I consider all of you part of our team, and so very grateful for your support, your collaboration, your feedback and insights. And um, I'm around now for questions and, and certainly throughout the conference. So would be happy to, to any, take any questions if you have any. Uh, so we have about 15 minutes for questions. Any questions? You, you can't ask one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your time. I was wondering how you communicate to participants this adaptive design, because um, I've only started to learn about it a few years ago, and it's complicated. It's complicated. So normally already to explain to someone what a trial means, uh, I can only imagine how much complex it is it can get for someone that, you know, it's not so close to, to, to these things. Yeah. No, that, that's a great question. So this is probably my first time presenting on an adaptive design. So welcome, welcome your feedback on that. Um, I think 
you know, when we lay it out with our clinicians and clinical trial staff, I can't speak to how they explain it to their patients. Um, so I, I, I guess I probably don't have a good answer for you, but I think what you bring up is the fact that we should probably equip them with more education um, to be able to set expectations within, within their patient community. Yeah, so that's a great point. There's another question back there. And it, it is, uh, Andres, it is very complicated. I think it's also complicated for sites because it's not, it may not be what they're used to as well. And so with an adaptive study design, you know, as you get new information and you make changes, it leads to amendments, right? And so you have to go through the amendment process with the clinical trial site, um, it, which then leads to reconsenting patients. You know, so there's multifaceted um, steps that are required. Um, which, you know, it, it looks like a great approach because of the information that you're, you're able to um, collect and really use data to drive decision making, but there are some, you know, ancillary challenges that I think are definitely part of the process. Yeah. Hi. If there's different, like, groups of people living with HD and we have, like, potentially different, are they SNPs, yeah. right? Um, does that mean that like the treatment for either of those two groups would potentially be different, or like how you go about it, um, and can like are we s or like is anybody still kind of applicable for treatment, or is it just one SNP group? I guess. Yeah, that's a great question. So the the way that we're approaching um, our study is by looking at one specific SNP, but I think uh, our hope is that again, you know, if if things look positive that we'll be able to expand into uh, other SNPs. Um, but I think the critical component, and I, I think what Lauren said well earlier, is that you know, some of the other approaches that are, are, are not allele specific may be open to more people because it's not a, a requirement to necessarily have one of these within, within your, your DNA. Um, but that is our hope, right, is to try to figure out, okay, if we, if we see a benefit within this kind of subpopulation, if you will, it would be great to then be able to see if we can expand the population that, that we're looking at. So can you explain how um, the SNPs are identified in each patient and like what the process of like confirming they will in fact be eligible for your study is? Yes, uh, so um, again, trying to think back to like the UK rules and how to answer questions, so bear with me. Uh, you know, so, so we've, we've developed an assay with um, uh, an assay company, um, which is public, uh, and so there is a blood test that, that is done to be able to analyze and, and figure out whether or not you have the, the SNP to be able to participate. Yeah. Hi, um, so my understanding with the SNP is that you are like replacing it with another um, I guess nucleotide, so that would change the protein in the sequence to a different protein. Is there any side effects or like, I guess, caution surrounding like that change in protein in the sequence? Of course, yeah. yeah great question, and I think, um, you know, as with the, the stage of development that we're at, that's certainly things that we're looking to, to learn, right? Um, and, and understand from the data what you know, what the, the side effects are, you know, you always wanna um, put that first and foremost uh, in the early stage trials is really 100% focus on safety and tolerability. So making sure, I think to your point, is there any off-target implications um, that, that's certainly being looked at as part of the, the safety analysis plan. Um, how would this be like administered to a patient? Yeah, so I think kind of going back to um, Peter's presentation um, earlier today, uh, this is, uh, it, it, our approach is an antisense oligonucleotide. Um, and so that was really categorized under the, the lumbar puncture. I have a follow-up question on that. Um, have you thought about using the reservoirs in the brain instead of lumbar puncture um, in terms of just targeting the striatum more efficiently? Um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, when, when you're doing clinical research and in some of the preclinical models, I think our, our approach was to make sure that um, any approach that we took 
it got to both the, sp the um, spinal cord and the brain. Um, and so I think, I think that was part of the decision making process. And you know, as you go through some of your preclinical studies, looking at mouse and animal models, um, you know, you want to see whether or not that holds true uh, before you actually get into to human trials. And so that's the approach that, that we've taken. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Well, thank you for all the questions. Again, I'm around as this kind of marinates over, overnight. I'll be around tomorrow as well. But really appreciate your engagement and the questions that you had today. So enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.